I never freeze. <laughs> Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Definition, aka your friendly neighborhood spoiler man, and this video we're breaking down the insane details in Black Panther. If that terrible impression at the start didn't offend you, then thanks for sticking around because we've got some great Easter eggs to go over that show just how much effort Marvel put into their movies. Obviously, there will be heavy spoilers here, so if you haven't had a chance to check out the movie yet, then I hope you get dusted in the snap because we're going to be going over everything. As always, smash that thumbs up button if you love Wakanda forever, and make sure you subscribe to the channel for videos like this every day. Without the way, thank you for clicking this, and let's get into our Black Panther breakdown. Okay, so Black Panther opens with a narration that tells of the meteorite that hit Wakanda many millennia ago. It enriched the earth and five tribes settled in the area, building advanced technological weapons, and they pretty much put the precious metal in everything that they owned. Vibranium is of course a material that's laced throughout the MCU, and it was famously used to create Captain America's shield. This was thought to be pretty much indestructible, however Black Panther actually managed to cut it in Civil War due to the fact that his claws are made of the metal too. The indentation in the earth that the meteorite leaves can also be seen in the film, namely as the location where the final battle takes place, and it's clear that the natives built themselves up around it. In this introduction, there's also a mention of the panther god Bast, and Bast is a true deity, and it features in the MCU as the god that granted the Black Panther with their abilities. T'Challa himself likely follows the religion of it too, as in the film just before the car scene, the character says, for Bast's sake, instead of for God's sake. It is likely that all tribes worship their own gods, as when M'Baku first shows up, he says, glory to Hanuman. Hanuman is a monkey god, M'Baku refers to himself as the great gorilla, and also dons a mask of the animal too, cementing this notion. We learn that this narration is actually being told to a young Eric Killmonger, and that he and his father have left the kingdom, which we see in the opening scene. This is where we cut to Oakland in 1992 and watch a young Eric playing basketball with a DIY basket. At the end of the film, after T'Challa has bought the property, the basketball hoop is replaced with a real one, showing the redevelopment that's gone on in the area since he acquired it. Now this opening is laced with a lot of subtle details, but it basically sets up the rivalry between T'Challa and Killmonger due to the choices of both their fathers. To me, the bloodlines sort of represent Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, as they both have opposing ideologies on how to get things done. T'Challa is more of a peaceful man that's trying to unite with the people, whereas Killmonger wishes to take things by force and any means necessary. The way they operate is also shown in their choice of suits, as T'Challa has the option to pick either the understated Black Panther costume or the golden one, and he goes with the former. Killmonger goes with the latter, more ostentatious one, because he's coming out and wants to be seen, whereas T'Challa is happy to remain in the shadows. In the first fight that the two have, T'Challa fights with a spear and a shield, whereas Killmonger chooses a spear and a sword, showing their differences in mindset. Upon drinking the heart-shaped herb, both characters visit their fathers in the afterlife, and it's clear that their dads weigh massively over their heads. The two are pretty much opposite sides of the same coin, and the movie subtly hints at the similarities between the two by reusing the iconography of Killmonger holding his father as he dies, which mirrors the way that T'Challa held his during Civil War. Both parents clearly love their sons, and no more is this exemplified than when the prince hears noises. They initially panic and cover up everything, and he looks out the window. Now it may seem that he's looking for the police, but they would be coming through the door, and instead he's just checking to make sure that his son's okay. We learn that Njobu had been leaking information on Wakanda to people, and in Age of Ultron discovered that this led to Claw storming the country. Now Marvel tend to do brilliant things with their timelines, and throughout the movies we often watch as technology improves. Black Panther is no different, and in the movie we see how the hologram technology improves over time, going from a blue image to a fully realised one. Other notable elements to take from this scene are that N'Jobu kneels before the king upon his entrance. In Infinity War, this kneeling is played for as a joke, but to me it actually shows that T'Challa has become his own man and won't have the same kind of leadership that his father did, which eventually led to his own brother betraying him. Now, Black Panther has one of the coolest costumes in the entire MCU, and when it first made its debut in Civil War, many eagle-eyed viewers noticed that the suit never made a sound. 
We learn in this film that this is due to the sneaking technology in it, and Shuri even shows off some new sneakers for the character. These have a cool little easter egg on them that redditors have spotted, and if you check out the letters on the pair of sneakers, they actually say heir to Chaka, as T'Challa is the heir to the throne. Now this is a play on the words heir, and heir to Chaka is a play on the famous sneakers Air Jordan. She says they are fully automated, which is also a nod to Back to the Future Part 2. Black Panther's costume stores energy, and this is shown by it lighting up with purple colouring. In Infinity War, Thanos slams Black Panther so hard it actually breaks apart all the energy stored and completely releases it, showing just how much that hurt. We can see a test in which they store up some kinetic energy, and Wakandan text appears on the torso, which translates to I love you mom. Now superheroes love branding, and we actually see the masks that the characters use reappear throughout the film. The Black Panther's faceplate is what the attack ships look like from the bottom, and this is a really cool detail that shows just how much the creative team were really looking into the overall world building. Killmonger's mask also appears similar to the dropships, and yeah, it, it's great just seeing these, these little bits of iconography popping up. We also see scales being worked on in the lab, and these later appear under Captain America's uniform, showing that he may have had a little help from the Wakandans after dropping off Bucky. Cap visits this location throughout the MCU twice, and the two scenes mirror one another very closely. Bucky is teased at the end of the movie, which sort of brings all of these moments together, and I, if you've watched my other video on parallels then you'll know I absolutely love things like this. Now speaking of locations in the film, we learn that Killmonger is launching spies in London, Hong Kong and New York. In Doctor Strange we discover that these are the locations of the Sanctum Sanctorums, and can gather from this that these are key locations on the planet that, if taken, can likely overthrow the world on both a physical and spiritual plane. Now one of the best characters in Black Panther is Ulysses Claw. After making his debut in Age of Ultron, he, he makes a much bigger impression here, and pretty much chews up the scenery every time he's on screen. In the aforementioned movie, when talking about how he obtained the vibranium, he says it came at great personal cost and rubs his neck, showing a brand given to him by the people of Wakanda. A dossier in that movie shows that Claw's great-grandfather was actually killed by a previous version of the Black Panther, so I love how this rivalry has existed throughout the ages. At one point in the film when Claw and Killmonger have a shootout, Claw actually wins and he hits Killmonger first, however he's wearing body armour and thus Eric is able to gain the upper hand on him. I, I tried to do a hand joke there but I couldn't think of a good one. I guess when it comes to rubbish jokes I need a hand. Now Claw in the comics is actually made of living sound and this is referenced in the film when he offers to give Agent Ross a mixtape. This happens at the casino and upon entering it the group say that there are seven Americans there. They manage to locate six when walking around, but there's a seventh that they can't find, and this is actually Stan Lee. Now another cool moment in the scene is that the costume design department deliberately dress the character in colours that resemble a pan-African flag. Again this ties into the whole costume design thing and it's great to see it popping up. Now they chase after Claw and he blows up the car. This isn't really an easter egg, I just love the way that the wheel continues to roll into the next shot. That is attention to detail for you. Killmonger goes to rescue him, and T'Challa dives on a grenade to show how much of a hero that he is. Steve Rogers of course did this in the first Avenger, to prove that he was willing to sacrifice himself, and this is one of the things that got him selected for the Super Soldier program. Now this all leads to Killmonger taking the throne after beating T'Challa. During the fight, Killmonger breaks his spear, which makes it very short. The Shaka Zulu of South Africa actually used to use this fighting style quite often, as it improved their chances of killing more people due to the speed that they could wield it at. Killmonger's face is cut during the fight, but the next time we see him, this is actually healed. This is because of the science department at the kingdom, which is also able to heal the bullet wound in Agent Ross very quickly, like Wolverine speed almost. Killmonger picks up T'Challa and throws him over a waterfall to his apparent death. Now what I love about T'Challa is that he often says things that ironically backfire on him. This is of course shown in the I never freeze thing that we did terribly at the start, but there are other examples too. In Infinity War, Black Panther tells the Black Order that Thanos will have nothing but dust and blood. This literally happens as Tony manages to get a drop of blood from the character, and after Thanos carries out the snap, 
everyone turns to dust. So he did, he did have nothing but dust and blood. He also says that this is no place to die before dying himself. And yeah, just, just be careful what you say, mate. Now Killmonger ends up taking the throne and he wears his father's ring on his hand rather than round his neck, showing that he's finally completed his mission. Throughout the throne room scenes, we can actually see that there's an empty chair and this is because M'Baku refuses to join the council and prefers to live in the mountains. He does end up helping T'Challa and Ko-Fi back and this leads to a big battle at the Vibranium mining facility. We can actually see that the Jabaris don't use any Vibranium and this is because the group reject the metal due to their beliefs. They actually wish to take Wakanda back to its roots and thus they, they just want to make things simple for themselves. Now this finale is a big battle that sees Everett Ross piloting one of the ships. He used to be a pilot and thus Shuri sets up the control panel to be similar to an F-16 which uses a hands on the throttle and stick setup to guide it. T'Challa manages to beat Killmonger and he takes him out to see the sunset. After becoming king, Killmonger actually said the sun will never set on the Wakandan Empire, but he must have been learning lessons from T'Challa because as the sun sets, the character dies along with his empire. If you ever become a Black Panther, just keep your mouth shut for the entire time. Now, after returning to Oakland, we get the credit scene in which the colors actually represent all of the Infinity Stones. This was of course put in place to tease the next film in the release schedule, which was Infinity War, and I appreciate its use here. Also, the music's really good. Anyway, that's our entire list of things we spotted, and, and also, yeah, did anyone notice that the Queen knows that Shuri did something behind her back because of T'Challa's expression when she sticks her fingers up? Just, just zoom in and look at his little face. Now, I know this didn't contain absolutely everything, but th there's just been so many breakdowns and I just wanted to talk about things that I hadn't really seen people mentioning before. Obviously, let me know if you think anything should have made the list, and if you enjoyed this video, then please drop a thumbs up, and make sure you check out our breakdown of Into the Spider-Verse, which is going to be linked at the end. If you want to support the channel and get to see some content early, then please consider clicking the join button below. We massively appreciate it, and it helps it so that videos like this can get made, and that I also don't have to get a proper job. And you can also come chat to us on our Discord server, link below or at Heavy Spoilers on Twitter. But with all that out of the way, thank you for making it until the end of the video. You've been the best, I've been Definition, and I'll see you next time. Take care, much love. Peace.